I've got a problem. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bull. Today, I've, I've, I've got a problem. If I don't fix this problem, I'm going to drown in shavings. The tool that I use to clear out my shop of shavings is not functioning. I'm not going to name the company that makes this particular tool, but I can tell you that the wood that they use for their handle is not so great. And to be fair, I leave this outside a lot, so it's taken a lot of weather too. It's, it's served well. But the scoop side of this shovel works really good for shoveling up shavings, and I need this really bad. So I started thinking, you know what? Let me solve this problem with a wood turning. Now, the first thing I ever turned on a lathe was a bowl. The second thing I've ever turned on a lathe was a bowl. The last thing I turned on the lathe was a bowl. I pretty much just turn bowls, but guess what? I'm gonna do some spindle turning today. A few years ago, I came across some hickory and I decided to take a few spindles and rough turn them and set them aside. I didn't know what I would use them for and today I discovered what I can use at least a couple of these for. So I'm going to fix my shovel so that I have a scoop to scoop up shavings and today we're going to do a very practical wood turning project. We're going to make, actually restore the shovel back to its original condition. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I need to get the broken piece of wood out of the shovel itself. So I'm going to use an angle grinder. And I'm just going to grind away this rivet that's in here. I'm going to have to replace that later with a bolt. The shovel says the this metal is tempered, and I think it is. I mean, this is not, obviously not very soft aluminum. It's taken a little while to cut through the head of this rivet. That's kind of interesting. I didn't realize that aluminum can be tempered, but I guess that's why I turn wood. <laughs> and I'm going to use a center punch to drive that pin out. And a smaller one to get down in there and continue getting it out. The wood got wet from being outside, so it's it's soaked and expanded, and it's a little snug in there. Okay, it's out, and I got to get that piece out. And there we go. Okay, so now I've got a regular shovel. Ooh, that's gross. And the main reason I needed to get that out was so that I could use it for a guide or a template to shape the piece I'm going to turn now. Now, my lathe is a robust Sweet 16 standard bed. This comes in three lengths, or at least the last time I checked, it came in three lengths. And the cool thing is, is I can make this bed longer by taking out this gap section and placing it on the end here. And the way that I do that to make sure it's lined up is basically hold it in position and then put the center of the tailstock over the gap and then tighten it and then I can tighten up those bolts and now I've got a longer bed for turning. I don't use this very often because as you guys know I turn bolts primarily. That's why I like the standard bed size. There's a longer bed and I believe there's a shorter bed. They also have a new model too. This is the Sweet 16 and there's a new model of that where they've changed some configurations and made it a little bit better. But all in all, this is a great lathe and I love it. And no, I don't get paid to endorse this lathe. It's just a sturdy, well-made lathe that I enjoy doing all my turnings on and it's great for the bull work that I do. Okay, so I'm going to use my calipers and get the width of the previous handle and that's what I'm going to turn down to. Now, what I'm going to do in my limited experience with spindle turning is I'm going to use a parting tool to work down to the depth in a couple different locations. I'm going to use that as a guide to work towards. If I start shaving away here, there's a good chance I'm going to turn it narrower than what I really need and it'll probably be inconsistent end to end. So instead I'll use a couple little points where I can 
preset the depth to the proper depth and then I'll work down to that depth. And that's what I'm doing here. And I know I could turn this with the, or I could check with the calipers with the piece turning. However, my calipers aren't ground down and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not comfortable doing that. So I'm stopping the lathe to use the calipers. Now when I'm using the parting tool, I'm making what's called a peeling cut. And a peeling cut is basically shaving away the top layer of the wood as it comes around. And we'll talk about that more in a second. All right, so I'm using my inch and a half skew here. And I'm making a shear cut across the surface. What I'm not doing with any of these tools is making a scraping I do not want to scrape this wood. This wood is dry. This is like five-year-old hickory. And what I've discovered is that the grain direction in this is not that great. At the time, I had a great big long log and I was going to cut it into bowl blanks, but I decided to cut it longwise and have some spindle sections maybe for down the road. And that's where we're at right now. But what I didn't know at the time was the grain inside this particular piece is a little wonky. It's not very straight and linear. If I had a nice straight grain with this, it would turn a little bit better. And here you can see what I'm doing with this slicing cut and the skew chisel. I'm letting the bevel touch the wood first. That's what's most important. If I hit the wood with the blade or the sharp edge first, I'm going to get a kickback. And obviously we don't want that. And I'm only engaging the center portion of the blade to do the slicing. Okay, so I'm going to work this edge down. Again, I'm using the slicing cut. And this wood is, you can see it's brittle and there's like a, it's kind of breaking apart in areas based on the grain direction. So I've got to be a little bit cautious here. I'm a little worried about knocking this end off and dropping the piece out of the lathe. And I probably could turn a lot faster. I'm just not comfortable doing that. I'm used to bowl turning speeds. All right, this is a peeling cut. And what I'm doing is I'm basically just raising the handle slightly and letting the turning wood come into contact with the cutting edge. This is not a scrape, this is a peeling cut. And this is good for quickly roughing down the material. Now I'm going back to a slicing cut. Because this wood is dry and brittle, if I tried to scrape it, it's going to damage the wood and it's going to just really take out big chunks and it's going to be nasty. Now I'm using that piece that I took out of the shovel and I'm just taking direct measurements off of it. The length of the piece. And then I'm going to try to get the width at about the center portion. And then we'll match the width on the end. So ideally, if this is done right, the end of the shovel handle will fit right into the shovel itself. So I'm going to use the calipers, get a measurement on that middle portion. Then I'm going to use the same technique. Now this is what I was talking about before. This is a peeling cut. It's a little tricky to see from this angle. I am not scraping with this tool. I'm presenting the, the front edge of the parting tool so that it peels away the wood as it comes around the top of the, of the turning. So a peeling cut is going to have the parting tool with the tip pointed up and the handle pointed down. So it's, it's positioned at an upward angle to the wood. It's not straight in. Straight in is a scraping cut and you're just going to tear away fibers that way. You're not really doing any kind of, um, it's not really a cut. It's a scrape. It's not really truly a, a cut. Okay, so I'm going to get a measurement at the end here. It's a little hard. They, they've got a relief that's cut into this and it's been compressed. I'm going to turn the width of that first. And the parting tool is really nice for quickly removing material from a small area. 
Yeah, you can take the calipers. There you can see the peel and cut a little bit better. See how the blade is engaging with the top portion of the wood as it comes around. Yeah, you can take the calipers and you can ease that pointed edge and you can bring the calipers up to the piece as it's still turning, but I just don't, I just don't do that. Because I don't do enough spindle work. If I did lots of spindle work, I would, I would have no problem doing that, but that's not what I do. I'm a bolt guy. Sometimes we have to do spindle work. Okay, so I have my two, you can see the two reference, actually three reference points there. On the right is the pencil line. That's the width of the handle, and we're going to try to maintain that. And then in the center is the center depth, and then on the left side is the final diameter for the end of the piece. So basically I'm just going to use a, a shear cut to reduce and remove all this material, slice it away. And I'm sorry, it's a slicing cut. I'm going to use a slicing cut to remove the material between these points and make this shape that we need. Here you can see how I'm just engaging the center part of the blade, not the bottom and definitely not the top. If you engage the bottom of the blade or the top of the blade, you're most likely going to get a skip back and damage the wood. So I'm just looking to see where the material is high and I'm working a little bit more in the high area and then I'm easing back and making a thinner cut in the areas that are very close. And I just want to kind of sneak up on that measurement. It's almost like sneaking up on the inside of a bull blank with the wall thickness. Here I'm really close. I'm just taking a really light cut across to blend all those areas together. All right, let's do a test fit. Oh, look at that. It fits first time. Well, that's nice. Sweet. Okay, so we'll continue the turning. Now, because we're end to end, and I'm using on the headstock end, I'm using a cup drive. And what that's doing is it's not, there's no spurs there. It's not gripping into the wood and forcing the piece. It's actually just a disc cup. And if for some reason I get a catch, what's really nice about that, if I get a catch, the wood's just going to spin for a second. And I'm also using a live center on the tailstock. So those two match up. So I can easily just flip this end to end. And what I'm doing here is creating some more points to establish my depth. And by establishing that depth, I'm not going to accidentally turn an area too narrow compared to the rest of it. I want a nice, evenly thick handle all the way down the the shovel. So I'll just keep working those areas and check them. So yeah, if, if you haven't done a lot of spindle work and you're, you're a little bit cautious about it, the cup drive, which I'll put a link to that in the description below, is a great way to start because if you do get a catch or if you get a skip back or something like that, the wood just spins. It doesn't come flying off. Well, it shouldn't come flying off, I should say. <laughs> it could do anything it wants based on the, whatever the conditions are. But typically, the wood will just spin inside that cup because you don't have deep spurs that are engaging it that are going to force the wood out of the lead. Instead, it's just going to spin on the, the location that it's mounted on. All right, so the depth has been established in several points. Now I'm going to use a slicing cut with the skew chisel and level out the entire piece. Now what I know about the skew chisel, I learned from Al Lacer. I have a video of Al Lacer's that's really good. He also teaches at the Mark Adams School, and he's known as the skew chisel guy. And he does a great job teaching it. If you're interested in learning more about the skew chisel, I highly recommend going to check out Alan Lacer and the information that he has. Because it's, it's very good and he does a great job of presenting it and makes it, it makes it usable 
versus a very scary tool. It's, it's very similar to the bull gouge. If you don't know what you're doing with the bull gouge, the bull gouge can be very intimidating. The same with the skew chisel. If you've gotten really nasty kickbacks and thrown pieces out of the lathe with the skew chisel, then you know what I'm talking about. But it doesn't have to be that way. And there's some very simple principles that you, once you understand them, it's, it's not bad. The basic principle here is you're always starting with the bevel rubbing the piece and then you just lightly lift the handle. And you also are only engaging with the center point of the cutting edge. If you do that, you're not going to get the kickback. And once you understand that, you practice a bit. Plus, you use the cup center or the cup drive so that if you do get a nasty nasty catch, it doesn't become this dramatic event on the lathe. You'll see that the skew chisel is actually a pretty nice tool and it creates a very nice finish and a cut. There I was going into open in grain, which was kind of a no-no, and I split out a piece you can see. Now this wood is it's hickory and it is hard as a rock it's heavy too i got this about five years ago from a tree that fell down across the street from us and i salvaged i got some really beautiful bull blanks out of it and it's just a gorgeous wood i later after the tree came down and did a little investigating i discovered it's a pignut hickory tree and this was crazy because during the research i I had to look around for clues. The tree was on the ground and it had been on the ground for a little while, so the leaves were pretty much all missing. And I came across some nuts that were around the base of the tree. And it turns out there's a variety of different hickories where I live, but only the pig nut hickory has a nut that is an inch and a quarter long. That would probably be, let me think, probably about 30 millimeters long and I'll be darned I went and measured a bunch of these nuts and they're all about the same length you have to think you have to wonder how in the world does that happen where you can have a species of tree that makes the same size nuts consistently through all of the trees that's pretty amazing anyway so I was able to harvest some wood from this and, and make some beautiful bowls and this particular piece was a long bowl blank and it wasn't long enough to get two bowl blanks out of, but it was long enough for about one and a half. And I didn't really want to slice it up and waste it. So I started thinking, well, maybe there'll be something down the road I can use some wood for some spindle turning. So I cut some long sections out and then I rough turned them and set them aside so they can dry. So they're really good and dry. This was about two inches thick and it's been five years. So if you use the rule of thumb, which we go over in my tree to bowl understanding green wood e-course, which is now available online, that wood takes about a year to dry for every inch of thickness. Well, this should be dry. And when we say dry, we actually mean equalized. Wood is never dry. But it's, it's relatively free of moisture at this point and hard as a rock. Now I'm gonna turn a tenon here for the handle portion of the top of the handle and I'm using a wrench as my gauge instead of the calipers. The small diameters you can use a wrench for which is nice. So I'm using a slicing cut and I'm using a peeling cut. You can see I'm just peeling away the layers of wood as they come over the top. So this, this section of hickory is, is, it actually taught me quite a bit. It was pretty fascinating. This had a very long and heavy cantilevered limb that came out of the tree at about a 90 degree angle. Well, the trunk below that rim took on all of the weight and pressure of that limb. And the grain inside that trunk had compression in it. Well, that compression translates into what's known as fiddleback. And it's these beautiful rippled patterns that appear in wood. And those can be found under heavy branches on trunks. And fiddleback is known as fiddleback because it's the beautiful wood that is veneered and used for the back of fiddles and violins. 
So if you look at this handle, you can actually see some of the fiddle back in here, and that's the compression of the wood grains, which looks great and everything, but it's actually not so great for a spindle or an end-to-end -end turning like this because we're really counting on that end grain to be nice and smooth and consistent so we can just slice away layers of it like I'm doing here. But instead, it's kind of got its own little wonky pattern going on. So it's, it's a little bit brittle and it kind of wants to do its own thing when I'm going against some of that rippled pattern that's inside the wood. But we're going to make it work. There you can see the slicing cut up close. Just taking off very thin layers. We, again, we want to work right up to the thickness, the desired th thickness. We don't want to make exact excessive cuts. Okay, so there's the main handle. You can see on the right side the tapered portion that goes into the shovel, and on the left side is the tenon which will hold the handle at the top. I was thinking about attaching that green plastic handle, then I thought, nah, I don't want a piece of plastic on the end of my handle. I'm going to make a handle for the top, and that's why I created that tenon. So I'm going to sand this through all the grits. I'm going to sand it down to 320. I started with 120. And it'll take it all the way down to 320. And I'll go up in increments of 50%. So I go to 120, 180, 240, and then 320. Now I'm going to use um, something I don't usually use is a friction polish. And what's really nice about this, you basically just wipe it on. A friction polish is kind of a combination of different finishes and it has varnish in it. And what happens is you basically wipe it on and then you turn the lathe speed up and then just buff it in. And it, the heat from the buffing kind of cures that onto the surface and you get a really nice shiny surface. And it's the wood is relatively well protected at that point. There you can see the fiddle back, those little ripples in the green. Okay, so now I'm gonna change the lathe back because I don't need to do quite as long of a turning. I'm gonna do a shorter piece for the handle. So I just bring the gap section back in and bolt it in place. Now I do understand that the new Robust Sweet 16, the bolts go down through the top, which is nice. The one I have, I have to actually bolt it in from the bottom. Okay, so here's another section of the spindle wood that I set aside years ago. And I'm going to cut a small piece off and just rough that into the top handle. I'm using a peeling cut here. I'm just, you can see my hand, the motion of the hand there. I'm just lifting the, the handle of the tool and just peeling away sections at a time until I get down to a nice round chunk of wood. Also, it's important to know that that fiddle back that I just mentioned, that's, it can be underneath a limb, is not found all throughout the tree. It's only going to be in that area underneath the limb where there was tension and pressure. So you may be thinking or hoping that you're going to find a whole tree that's filled with fiddleback. Well, it's usually not. It's just going to be in select sections where the, the trunk or the main section of the tree had a, a tremendous weight above it, such as the heavy limb that was sticking out over above it. Okay, so I'm using peeling cuts to rough away material, and then I'm using slicing cuts to smooth out the round cylinder from the piece. Spindle turning is pretty nice. I like it. I, I, I just, some, for some reason, I just love making bowls, and I would kind of rather be making bowls, but this was, this was definitely a necessity. I had to get my shovel fixed. <laughs> And I really didn't want to go buy another shovel because the scoop of it's perfectly fine and can last for a long time. So right now this piece is small enough, you can visually tell if one side's thicker than the other. And it's pretty even at this point. Now I'm going to bring it down to the same thickness as the other portion of the handle. I'm using the parting tool to peel away a little bit and then I'll take a measurement. So 
So when it comes to lathe speed, I'm very comfortable working at the top speed for bowls without becoming too excessive. Spindle turning, you can turn a lot faster because you have a much smaller mass at the axis of the turning. If you, if you want to learn more about lathe speed and turning, check out the video I've got on lathe speed. I'll put a link up above. All right, here I'm actually just taking a real life measurement of my hand, which will be holding this handle, and placing that for the width on the handle itself. Okay, so back to the parting tool. I'm gonna mark the ends of the handle a little bit deeper. It will be cut off here. And what I'm gonna make is our two tenons. Then it'll allow me to put this in a chuck and flip it around and reverse it. So I'm gonna peel away the end on one side. And with this, such a uh, short area, the parting tool can be used to clean that up pretty quickly. Plus, it's a little difficult to get that big skew chisel in there. And yeah, you could have a smaller skew chisel, but I, ha I prefer using a larger skew chisel for pretty much everything. There are a number of other cuts you can make with that skew chisel. It seems large and cumbersome, but once you get used to it, it's actually, it's actually pretty neat. So the lathe speed, it could be much higher. So in other words, in, in wood turning, in turning spindles and into end turnings like this, you can get up to two, three, four thousand RPMs without any problem. If the piece comes off, because it's rotating at such a small center of axis, it typically will just drop. Whereas a bowl turning at high speeds like that and having the outward centrifugal force of the diameter of the bowl can be very dangerous and can come off flying at speeds more than a thousand rpms typically for whatever reason and under a thousand rpms with a bowl if it comes off the lathe it's probably going to go down and meaning it's going to go down towards the ground if it's above a thousand RPMs, especially up at something as fast as a spindle turning at like 4,000 RPMs, it can go straight up and at you or into the ceiling. And I've seen it happen before. I haven't done it, but I've seen it happen. <laughs> Not that I haven't thrown bulls off the lathe. I've definitely done that. Of course, if you've watched my videos, you've watched me throwing bulls off the lathe. And that's going to happen. It's not a big deal. Okay, so I have the handle turned almost to the even thickness that I want. It's nice to see a short piece like this because you can tell it's pretty even all the way across just by seeing it with your eye. The longer piece, based on where you're positioned, you're really not sure if it's got, if it's centered or not, or if it's leveled throughout. Okay, so I'm marking the center of the handle. And there's a little ding here. I'm going to use that as a center point for the mortise. I'm going to do a through mortise. We're going to drill all the way through this. I need to drill a, a seat for the other handle. And that needs to be the same diameter as the handle. Plus, I need to drill a hole for the tenon that we created in the longer part of the shovel handle. So now this will be the seat that will receive the handle. This is the same width as the handle itself. I just need to bring this down to where I have a flat point on the handle. All 
All right, it's looking pretty good. It is a little off center, and that has to do with my initial pilot hole being a little bit off center. It would have been nice to have taken a little more time and centered that up, but it is what it is. Now I'm using a Forstner bit to drill out the tenon or the mortise for the tenon for the handle. And I'm going to start a hole on the other side so I don't have a bunch of wood rip out when I come through. And that's the benefit of having that pilot hole is I know where that hole is going to come through pretty, pretty closely. This dry hickory is very dense and friction and heat are building up dramatically so you want to clear those shavings out as much as possible. Very hot. Okay, so we have our mortise established. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a relief point here. I'm not going to cut all the way through, but I want an area that's going to be the indicate where the side of this handle will be. But I'm going to leave that as a tenon for right now, and I'm going to put my chuck in. And I'm going to mount this to the chuck, which will give me that opposite side freed up so I can finish the opposite side and then flip it around. And I'm just making this up. If you guys know a different way to make this more efficiently, it's just problem solving and it's kind of, it's fun because there's, there are lots of different ways to go about doing this. There's definitely more than one way to solve this puzzle. But the way I'm doing it here is I made that tenon that you see now in the chuck. Now that frees up the right side. For the time being, I'm going to put the tailstock in there so I have some stability so I don't knock it off center. And I'm going to work down the side of the handle. I'm using the parting tool to remove some material. I really want to make a cut across that end because we have those ingrain fibers. They're pretty dense. I could just go right through with the parting tool, but I'm going to use my spindle detail gouge. And now we've got the tailstock out of the way. This, the tailstock now at this point, if I cut through, becomes a pinch point and that can bind up and cause a nasty catch and dislodge the handle. So I was thinking I could get in there with the spindle detail gouge, but I can't quite get the right angle, so I have to remove some more of this waste material. Still can't quite get in there. You don't realize how much of an angle you need until you get into a little tight spot like this. Okay, there I'm able to get to him and just nibble that down, almost like the the nub at the base of a bowl for the tenon. Just kind of nibble it down. Except this is in grain, so we're cutting through it at a 90 degree angle and boom, that just popped right off. So we just clean that ingrain and cut it right there. Now what I did is I reversed the handle. I just put a little bit of uh, gaffer's tape around the other end of the handle and I've got it into the chuck just being held there loosely. I just put the gaffer's tape on so the jaws of the chuck don't create marks on it. And now I'm going to remove the waste material from the opposite side of the handle. And again, I'm using the speed, spindle detail gouge here to remove that excess material. You can see how I'm using. I really want to cut those ingrain fibers because if I get go through here with the parting tool, it's going to rip it out and there's going to be torn grain on that end of the handle and we don't want that. With a spindle detail gouge right here, I'm cutting those ingrain fibers instead of tearing them out. Okay. Just clean up that point. It's looking good. And I'm going to go ahead and sand all of this. And we'll put a little finish on it.
and it will go fit it to the other part of the handle. Just kind of ease the corner there too, to soften up that sharp edge, the 90 degree edge. And I'm going to apply some friction polish to this side of the handle. So we get the speed up with the friction polish. Just wipe a little on, buff it. It's dry to the touch pretty quickly, which is nice. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this out, pull off the gaffer's tape. Again, the gaffer's tape was being used to make sure the jaws weren't damaging the wood. And I'm just going to lightly wrap that around the other side, place it back in. And then we'll apply some friction polish to the other side of the handle. Okay, so I'm going to put the handle in the vise and I'm going to slice a gap in the tenon. And the idea is that I'll be able to put a wedge in here to, to spread that tenon and make it fit inside the mortise that we just created on the top handle. I'm using a thin Japanese saw. to make this cut. Those little saws are just incredible. What's nice about them is they leave like almost no kerf at all. The space that's left where the blade itself is so narrow. And I took a couple slices there and, and created a gap. The only problem is, is that in all of my turning, I really made that mortise way too wide. It should I should have a snug fit here. So I ended up having to wedge in a variety of different pieces in here to make this work and I glued it up, which is not the most ideal, but I've trimmed that off and I'm going to sand it down so that it's flush with the top of the handle. I could have spent a little more time making that mortise and tenon fit better, but all in all you get the idea there. And then I'll apply finish again to this and then buff that out. And we're going to put it together. Now I will have to put a bolt in this so it doesn't fall off, but just tapping it in is making it fit really well. I love that. It's time to scoop up some shavings, I think. Let's see if it works. I'll be darned, it works. <laughs> So there we have it, a replacement handle complete with a grip at the top and it fits really good and it works as good or better than the previous one. So we could take this and this plastic handle and this cheap wood and just pitch it. Don't need that anymore. And now I've got my shovel back and I can clean up the shop and get the shavings out of here. I'll tell you what, it's quite a relief and it's fun to be able to make your own parts and fix something like that and not have to go to the store and buy another whole shovel, which is kind of wasteful. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. I greatly appreciate that. And subscribe if you're not already subscribing. And let me know what you think of this. Is this inspired you to perhaps repair something around the house that you might have as well? I gotta be honest with you. I don't know if it was because of the hardness of that hickory that's been dried for over four years, or what, but that seemed like work to me. And I'd much rather be turning bowls. And I think that's what I'm gonna go do right now. So until next time, happy turning.